Thanks a lot. Um, my talk today is about API security blind spots and uh, how to mitigate API abuses using machine learning. So I think most people in this room are, understand the importance of, of API security, um, but often we have to interact with stakeholders who may not have the same level of understanding as we have. And I like to explain to these stakeholders why is it that security specifically at the API layer is so important. You know, there's a lot of security testing that happens already. Do you really need to do security also at the API layer? And what I like to explain to these stakeholders is that the reason why API security is so important is that hackers use your API outside of your app. Your client-side app is what I mean here. Your client-side app restricts what your API does, if you think about it. And, and if, you, if you skip that layer, you end up in, in, in a new zone where you've got unexpected and untested for API abuse scenarios, things that end up being a blind spot from an API security testing perspective. And it gives hackers the freedom to poke around and find vulnerabilities, and there's a lot of blind spots involved uh, with this. So the lack of visibility is one of the biggest issue, or maybe not the biggest, but the most common issue, certainly, that we encounter on the field. When we talk to people about API security, a lot of them tell us that they're just not confident that their security teams are even aware of all the APIs that are out there. Uh, we actually did a survey, uh, and that was one of the questions on the survey recently, and 51% and of the people related to this. And so why is that, right? What, what are some of the reasons why people are not sure that they, they have all, the, all their APIs on their radar? And one of them is that you know, there's been an explosion of APIs, right? It's been at least a decade for many organizations that, that APIs have been developed, and then new versions come out, and sometimes you can't deprecate an old version for a while, and then eventually you forget about those old versions, and they're still sitting out there. Um, we're all familiar with shadow IT. Well, there's shadow APIs as well, right? Different groups within your organizations that will create applications and in which the API that powers those applications will be considered an implementation detail. It's, it's an implementation detail. Nobody really knows about that API except for a couple of scrum teams that are working on this application, right? It's not meant to be an API by itself. It's just something that powers the application. Some people talk about private APIs, but those APIs have the same risk from a security perspective. So obviously, you can't secure what you're not aware of. And to me, that's the first and, and, and most important blind spot when it comes to API security. So let me tell you about a few examples of, of API security blind spots. So last, maybe two months ago now, Landmark White, uh, you might have heard about that incident but there was an API that originally was supposed to be an internal only API, but somehow it made its way um, available to the public side. And, and Landmark White in Australia is the main property valuer. And so property valuation details were leaked, contact information was leaked, uh, reputation was, was damaged. A lot of banks that interact with Landmark White for the purposes of property valuation were in a hurry to distance themselves, disassociate themselves with Landmark White. Um, and the CEO resigned, right, is now looking for a job. Uh, so real consequences. So this is an API that wasn't authenticated at all. And that happens, you know, some APIs fall through the cracks. But doing authentication, obviously, is not everything, it's just a starting point. 
And if you remember what happened with USPS last year, they did authentication there, right? There was a, a token, an OAuth token that was needed for a client application uh, to call the, the, the API. And so user A would, would call the, the API via the, the application, right? It was a single page application, and then user B would do the same thing. But somebody figured out that if you skip the application, as long as you have a valid token and a valid account, you can go and get, uh, uh, call this API and, and effectively retrieve data for any user on that platform. And if you think about the blind spot here from a security testing perspective, you can't do this through the client side application. You really need it to skip that layer in order to exploit that vulnerability. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, what happened there where they were harvesting a lot of data, that, to me, that, that's a data exfiltration example as well, right? They, they weren't breaking any rules necessarily, but they were doing something that should have been spotted by somebody, right? So another form of what we call data exfiltration. Here's one uh, that I call the abstraction layers gone wrong, and I'm not gonna say which customer that was. But here's what happened. There was a requirement for a new API to, to be created by a team. Uh, they needed a modern design. It had to be like a nice, clean REST API with a JSON uh, uh, structured data. The, a, a schema was created and everything. We, they decided how authorization, uh, authentication would happen. Uh, a whole bunch of rules, business rules, were defined as part of that. But at implementation time, that development team realized that they had this, this legacy XML service from the SOA days that effectively allowed them to do that. So they did the lazy thing that a lot of people do nowadays. They did SOAP to REST, and they implemented a thin layer on top of that legacy service doing the new schemas that were defined the, the implementing all the new rules and stuff like that. And then testing happened, right? So uh, they tested according to the new requirements, the schemas, the authentication rules, and all that stuff. And then they, they deployed. Who knows what happens next here or, or think that they know what happens next? It's obvious, right? Of course. Some hacker on the outside is maybe he's as old as me, and he remembers the SOA days, and he remembers that legacy format. And if he sends that to that new API endpoint, because these things weren't hooked up properly, there, you can imagine, right, the if statement on the arrival of, of a message. If XML, skip this thing and go there. And they implemented all the security rules in that new layer. So these guys had a massive vulnerabilities because the, the security was completely attached to the new API format. And back to thinking about the blind spot issue. Th those security testers may be API focused and they might be doing API security testing, but how, why would you expect those guys to know about this legacy XML service? It's not even part of the requirements, right? So that's a massive blind spot. Um, API level denial of service, this is something that was discovered in the Kubernetes API server uh, API, where if you set it a JSON patch with tens of thousands of instructions, you would overwhelm a process in the back end, and you were effectively doing what I call an API level denial of service. And this is the kind of stuff that and, and just for background, I, I, I was, uh, if, if you're familiar with layer seven, the, that layer seven gateway, I was the first developer there. So I did a lot of API security for, for many, many years. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that you can catch at that layer, right? You can do validations that, um, that would check that you can't go beyond a certain number of operations. But somebody has to think about that, right? A human needs to think about the static rule that you should 
define on a gateway layer in order to catch that, that kind of stuff. Um, in an e-commerce uh, scenario, there was uh, another API where somebody could send a quantity field with a negative value, right? This is another example of a field that you can, you can do some validation and cache that, but you, again, you need to think about that. And, and most people are not investing a tremendous amount of time in being proactive about setting these rules. So another blind spot. Stolen tokens, there's not much you can do about that these days, right? We've got uh, uh, the concept of token, uh, token binding that that's, should be hopefully by next year's API days we'll be talking more about that. But nowadays tokens are bare tokens um, and if, if, if an attacker interjects themselves into a handshake, an OAuth handshake, uh, because a user is, is gullible and they can be fished, you end up having an attacker that, that has a token that's meant for legitimate application, um, and arguably that's not a vulnerability um, on, on the API itself, but the API now is being called by a malicious user that has a valid token that is not supposed to be having. And, and that is the basis for a lot of API attacks that we see. Uh, tokens can be stolen very, uh, in, in many different ways, right? People will download collections from the dark web, and because of password reuse, you can spray those to an authorization server and get a few tokens. People use def default credentials. And just the fact that client applications are really, really bad at keeping secrets, there are a lot of things that leak there. So earlier this year, there was uh, a, a study that demonstrated I think there were like hundreds of thousands of client secrets like API keys and tokens on GitHub, right? So that, that's the kind of reasons why you can't trust clients to keep secret on your behalf. But anyway, um, hackers use those credentials to impersonate users, stole tokens, and from an API perspective, what are you supposed to do, right? If you can't trust your own tokens, how are you supposed to secure your API traffic? So that leads me to talk to you about persisting API security gaps. There are some blind spots in foundational API security. You've got unexpected outside the app type scenarios. You've got a deficit of available expertise. If you think about the people, the humans that need to define the static rules to apply in your foundational API security, those are the kind of people that need to not just under, understand security and potential vulnerabilities, those are people that need to understand your API, how your application works, how your API infrastructure is set up. There's just not a lot of these people in your organizations. And maybe a lot of you guys in the room are those people. If, if, if you've ever heard somebody on your team said, man, I wish I could clone you, we really need you. That points to a human problem in API providers from a security perspective. And then there's the fact that uh, foundational API security tools are looking at security from a real-time security perspective, meaning that an API call comes in, let's say I'm a gateway, I look at the API call, and based on that and, and a few other parameters, I need to decide if this should be allowed to go through or not. That's how real-time security works, and you just can't catch every type of attack using real-time security. And then there's external vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities in your downstream application. Yeah, you might be expecting your downstream API endpoint to be doing reasonable amount of security, and maybe that's what happened at USPS, for example, right? Maybe the expectation was that we'll do authentication at the edge and whatever comes behind us should be responsible for doing the authorization, but it doesn't always happen, or maybe something goes wrong there. There's external vulnerabilities, so users uh, are, are sometimes gullible, uh, they can be phished, uh, users reuse passwords, that's a vulnerability that you can't control on the API side, but is a security issue still for you as an API uh, publisher. 
uh, clients that can't keep secret, bearer tokens. Those are all types of vulnerabilities that are external to the API, but that cause a, a big problem when it comes to your API security. So how can we mitigate these vulnerabilities that are persisting? You can improve your security practices in your organization. You can hire more people. Maybe you can clone some of those humans that are uh, holding all the, the needed information to be able to improve that. But that you know, will only you know, minimize this risk and it never goes completely to zero. And that's, why, that's where um, AI comes in, specifically machine learning. So we're, we're talking about the branch of AI called machine learning. And machine, the way the machine learning works is you're applying big data to build a mathematical model which you then use to make predictions, okay? And in this case, your big data can be created from your API traffic. So this is, this is an opportunity. If you have an existing API and traffic goes through it, you can generate data around this API and then you can build a model around that. And that's how you mitigate these persisting risks using machine learning. So you can learn from your API traffic, gradually build that mathematical model that represents your API traffic. Your, your, your API, and, 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 and then at runtime, the, the prediction aspect of it is when, when an attacker uses your API outside of your app, which is what we started this, this presentation on, because, because the API is used outside of your app, that stands out from the model. Your, your API is now being called di uh, differently, right? The timing might be different, the sequence might be different, you might be poking around in ways that your app doesn't, and that allows um, the, the, the machine learning engine to spot a deviation from the model and, and then predict that the token or, or whatever is used to access an API is being used outside that legitimate application. And then you can use that information to block, for example, a, a compromised token or just do some notifications and alerts but at least get visibility on this. So the benefits of using machine learning in that way is that first of all, you're, you're, you're reacting to this expert deficit. There's very minimal human input to get started here. We're talking about um, an AI engine that is gradually building a mathematical, mathematical model for your API traffic. The input that's required is not a human input with a bunch of static rules. The input that's required is your API traffic. So it's already there. You might as well leverage that. And the user still has control. So no input required to, to get started doesn't mean you don't have control. You still have control. It, so the, the second benefit, obviously, is it augments existing API security. It catches potential missing rule at that layer. It catches breaches that are not otherwise detected today. Right now, uh, you know, when you see reports of API uh, breaches, it looks like most attacks take months to years to be detected. With something like that, you're reducing this to maybe minutes or seconds. And then the other benefit is that you get an added API insight. So it's not just about security, but it gives you insights on your API traffic, your health, and things like that. And I'll, I'll dig in a little bit deeper in that, but that is to address that initial issue that people are not confident that they even know in the first place uh, about all the APIs that they have out there. And another trick up our sleeves is hacker deception. And this is where you're leveraging the hacker's behavior against the hacker. It's kind of like judo when you're using your open and strength against himself, right? The idea is that your, your legitimate applications, they don't poke around. They only call the API endpoints that they know about. And in this case, you can set these traps, these decoys or honeypots that 
hackers will try to hit, and then when a hacker goes to such an endpoint, it looks normal, like we'll return 200 okay, but in the background, we're actually flagging that requester. And then later on, when that hacker tries to access a legitimate API, we can block them. So we went from years, months, minutes, to pretty much real time. Um, and then lastly, um, about visibility, the way that we, uh, with Ping Intelligence for APIs, and, and we, that, we do have a workshop on that tomorrow, hopefully we can see you there, or at the booth for that matter. The way that we, we give you that visibility is that we can be attached to any, any API endpoint. So it could be a, an API gateway, like, like one of the best breed API gateway, like a MuleSoft or an Axeway. Uh, a WSO2, which is a sponsor here. We, we have formal integrations with all the gateway vendors. You can hook us up at, at the low bouncer level as well, like an Nginx. You can hook us up to Amazon CloudFront. We, we can even look at traffic inline in some cases. Uh, and so that unifies your uh, API traffic information from all these different sources into a centralized um, analysis. And that allows you to discover APIs that perhaps are not on your radar today. And then also uh, forensics. Forensics is, is, is very important from a regulation perspective, but just good security practice in general, right? If it, if it took you a few seconds before you were able to block an attack, for example, there might have been a few requests that happened from that attack before it was effectively blocked and you need to be able to go and, and find out what damage was done because you will need to repair that damage or maybe which users are affected. And so the ability to get that forensic information is, is extremely critical. So I notice we have three minutes uh, left and it sounds like we have time for a question or two. Anybody? Oh, there's a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you have any way to deal with false positives? Like if you change the functionality of the API, how to not detect that as an attack? Yes. Yes, like everything that has to do with machine learning, false positives is an important consideration. So the way that our machine, learn, machine learning engine works. If you have sufficient data around your API traffic, you, you won't see false positive. But we, we do have mechanisms to deal with them because sometimes there will be a change in your application, your API, and you might see some false positives. Or maybe you're in a state, in a state where you don't have sufficient amount of data. You just started deploying this, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, the way that most people would leverage that is that they, they would run Ping Intelligence for API uh, in non-blocking mode just to see, you know, what kind of exceptions and deviations I'm getting until you're confident that you can turn this on. But despite this, uh, uh, you know, you will perhaps get a false positive. And the way that you deal with that is, is we give the user of Ping Intelligence for API a tool that allows uh, um, the user to provide some, you know, say this entry on the blacklist should be, should not be blacklisted. And that allows Ping Intelligence to further learn from that and, and it allows you to unblock maybe a party that has been blocked. Great, so thank you, Francois. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>